genetic um, knockouts that have been become very popular in the last couple of years have shown, uh, probably more of them have shown um, that you can knock out certain genes of your irreducibly complex machinery and have no discernible effect on the phenotype. Most of these uh, studies don't get published because negative uh, data doesn't get published. Um, so some of these irreducibly complex machines can lose some of their parts. Okay, you, just, you have to be careful. You can't toss around this phrase uh, you know, here and there. You have to be careful. You have to inspect the system. A lot of systems have redundant parts. If, I, you know, uh, if a, uh, a tire on my auto goes flat, I can still drive you know, a fair distance with the three tires. If all four of them go flat, I'm, I'm in bad shape. So certainly a, the auto needs a tire or two or something like that. Uh, but redundant systems can be built in. It's, it's not clear how Darwinian evolution would explain redundant systems, however. And I've read a number of people who, who wonder how to explain that within the Darwinian paradigm. But for irreducible complexity, you can't just snap your fingers and say, boy, look how complex that is. It needs all its parts. You have to go through and understand what the parts are doing. And only then uh, can you say, you know, this might be a mixture of necessary parts plus extras. Only after an examination, only when you know what the structure of the system is, then can you say, you know, these are the components uh, that are really necessary for the irreducibly complex system. And uh, there might be some extras on there as, as well. The first point is, like you point out, the, inherent, the apparent intelligent design. But there's a, one of the things that's been recognized since Darwin's time is the, the monstrous stupidity of some of the designs that are present in nature. And I'm sure you've heard this argument before, but things like <coughs> flight feathers on the wings of birds. Now, in some species, like ostriches, these may be used in display. But in many species, they serve absolutely no purpose. So if you postulate that the flightless birds came from a flying bird, you can explain some of this. But this does not seem like intelligent design to have things like leftover wing claws on some species of birds, or leftover flight feathers, or leftover pieces of pelvic girdle in snakes and in whales. This does not seem like intelligent design. It seems like if in Oh, well, I suppose it could be a rather stupid intelligent designer, but it does not imply like an omnipotent <laughs> like, designer like by any means. Or something like that. Um, <laughs> another thing is, well, like the aliens, I'm not saying anything about God or anything. Yeah. I'm just saying like right. it could be intelligent, right. but not very well done. More kind of um, <laughs> Another thing is, we, we can observe <coughs> natural selection in action today. I mean, one of my professors is, she and her husband go to the Galapagos Islands, and they observe finch evolution. They observe how the interactions of rainfall influence seeds and seed distribution and how this modifies things like beak size or size of the birds. And uh, finally, I guess what I'd like to say is I think the fundamental flaw here is you're saying that an irreducibly complex structure cannot be derived from a reducibly complex structure. It is possible, for example, the, the point of the scaffold argument is that this irreducibly complex structure has been taken from a structure. Now, this is regardless of whether it's been created by a human or processes of natural selection, this irreducibly complex structure has been taken from a structure which was before reducibly complex. And it may be that other biochemical pathways or other proteins may have existed upon which components of these systems were assembled. And that in this system, like, and in this way, these various pieces may have been placed in one by one, each one of which would have increased the survival ability of the animal, and finally, in which the original system around which it was all built is no longer necessary and eliminated. And that, and in that sense, you have not done what you said must be done to refute Darwin, and you have not said that we have demonstrated conclusively that there are things that exist that simply cannot be explained by Darwinism. Uh, good. Uh, stay there. You can remind me of the points uh, that, that you made. I, I'm sure I, I'll forget most of them. But taking the last one uh, first, science can't prove anything conclusively. And to the extent that my idea is scientific, it is, uh, it is, it is uh, tentative. Just like the Big Bang Theory is tentative. Big Bang Theory might be overturned next week. My ideas might be overturned next week. That's just the way science works. It, it is not logic. It is not mathematics. It does not present deductive proofs. Uh, right now, I don't think so. I think the evidence is very good for it. I think it's the way to go. And I think science should follow wherever the evidence lead. Even if you don't think intelligent design is good, maybe even in the future you think uh, that it will uh, be 
you know, overturned or something. I would argue as a scientist you should still follow that data where it leads because you won't make progress by ignoring what seems to be an obvious conclusion in the hopes that something better will come along. Uh, the, the road to progress sometimes goes through, uh, through uh, models which uh, later are turned, uh, seem to be not true, but you have to go through them. Uh, let me say I, I don't think that will happen to intelligent design. I think that's the final truth. <laughs> but uh, uh, the second point about the irreducible complexity of the arch, uh, I'd have to argue with you about that. Uh, I would argue that, I, I would bet you <laughs> that, the, uh, that this uh, scaffolding structure is never uh, spelled out. And that might be irreducibly complex too. And whether or not it is, all we have shown is that uh, humans can put together irreducibly complex uh, structures, which we knew in the first place. Um, can you remind me of your first point? I was. Uh, um, the first point is uh, the fact that there are adaptations, which I mean, this is not. It's the oh, argument is that intelligent design, if it is intelligent design, is not very good intelligent design okay. in the sense that there are adaptations are present that are completely useless, like on a on an emu, which is about a three, it's about three foot tall hips. You have these tiny little arms that are three inches long. They're completely useless for any purpose. The existence of feathers and such things on emus is, I think, a good argument for common descent. That is, it came from some animal that used its arms that had feathers. But evolution, uh, Darwinian evolution is not the same thing as common descent. Darwin's claim to fame, the, the notion of common descent was floated long before Darwin. His claim to fame was that you know, he had developed, he had thought of a mechanism that would power these changes. I mean, in the absence of mechanism, you know, common descent is like you know, looking at Dr. Jekyll turning into Mr. Hyde and saying, don't, don't worry, you know, that's just evolution. You know, we'll explain how it, it happens later, you know, but, but it's common descent. You know, it's, it's astonishing, and we should be astonished by it. Uh, so s stuff like feathers on all birds, even flightless birds, might be explained well by common descent. But that does not address how feathers got there in the first place. You know, maybe a better example of, of what you're thinking about is something like, say, the, the uh, blind spot in the vertebrate eye. A number of people point to that. Uh, the vertebrate eye. Uh, the uh, nerves coming from the retina, actually the retina is on the back like the film of your eye and it comes out, instead of going back towards the brain, it comes out and the nerves circle around and go through a, a hole in the retina and then go back the optic nerve to the brain and many, uh, well not many, a number of people have pointed to this and, and said this looks like a, an example of poor design. What kind of an intelligent designer would arrange things in that way. And uh, uh, typically I respond that, well, you know, I don't know is, is the answer. But that, you know, you cannot say that that looks like poor design, therefore retinal, rhodopsin, phosphodiesterase, all the other elements of the visual cascade, therefore arose by natural selection. It's just a non sequitur. Additionally, it depends on uh, the assumption that this arrangement does not have a functional use. And in fact, a number of ophthalmologists have argued that this apparently backwards wiring is necessary for uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, rod cells to be, get a, a large supply of blood and to slough off the dead, red cell, uh, dead, rod, uh, dead rod cells because they uh, are used up quickly in the highlight uh, highlight environment that vertebrates typically occupy. Uh, so I call that the argument from imperfection. And while it seems to have some force with a lot of people, it doesn't, to, to me, explain how the complexity got there in the first place. Thanks.